you may be seated. And if we have any kids that want to head over towards Children's Church, they can head over that way for everybody else. If you are going to be hanging out in here with us and you have a Bible with you or something you read your Bibles on, there's two passages of Scripture, two places I really want you to turn to. The first, again in this series, we're going back and setting the tone for where we're going to be today from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But then, once again, over in the Old Testament, we're going to be in the book of Judges, Judges chapter 6 and Judges chapter 7. If you have a device you're reading on, you want all the notes from the message on in hand, you can scan this code. And if you've got the Bible app on your phone, it'll open that up as well. But other than that, let's jump straight in to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. All right, so this morning, we are in the fifth week of this series that we're calling, in quotations, Unlikely Heroes. And what we're trying to do throughout this series is we're trying to look at how God often chooses to use people in this world who are just like us to do great things, as unlikely as we seem to be, as improbable as what God calls do may seem very or even as impossible as it may be and I can hear my microphone going out is it going out Steve I saw you shake your head back there so I'm gonna have to go back to stand-up comedian routine here pull this microphone what's the deal with airline food all right um you know, one of the similarities that kind of pops up over and over again in some of the unlikely hero stories that we've been looking up is the issue of fear. Or at least two out of the three that we've talked about has been the issue of fear. You know, David is a bit of an outlier when it comes to fear because David, as a teenager and probably just pumped up on adrenaline and just being a young boy, he's ready just to roar into battle with a sling and some stones. But think about Jacob. We talked about Jacob a couple weeks back, and Jacob was scared of his brother. And Jacob is scared of going home and facing his brother Esau. Even Moses. Moses was scared that he had been found out as a murderer. And Moses was scared even 40 years later to go home and to do what God was calling him to do. But I want to ask you this morning, what about in our lives? Are we fearful people? What are the things that we are afraid of? Maybe you can think in your head right now some of the things that you might mention. Well, I'm afraid of this or, or I'm afraid of that. If you uh, remember a student of history way back when President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he once famously said that we have nothing to fear but fear itself. I don't know about you, but a fear looked like this. You got that picture up there? If fear looked like this, then I would wholeheartedly agree that we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Does anybody want to wrestle Moe's in the barn? Um, you know, at one time, most people in, in life, most people would have listed things like spiders. Anybody scared of spiders? Anybody scared of snakes? <laughs> Debbie's just shooting her hand up really big back there. Anybody scared of the dark? Any, any of those people? I remember when I was young, I used to hate the dark. I knew there was nothing in the dark, but when mom and dad would have me like go out in the middle of the night to take out the garbage to the road and the neighbor's dogs would always be like out there barking at me. It wasn't just so much the dark, it was the stuff in the dark, right? That was probably never there. But that's kind of the things that we're afraid of, things like that, physical things. How many of you have ever seen, do you got, you got this next slide up here? How many of you have these? If you can just look at these, does anybody have any of these? Can you identify with any of these? You can, I'm not even going to try to read these, but I'll tell you what they are in, in order. That first one is a fear of being buried alive. Anyone? Fear of buried alive. Second one is a fear of cats. Don't come around our house. Um, next one is a fear of hospitals. Next one is a fear of germs. The next one down is a fear of vegetables. That is me. Uh, that is me. Uh, the next one, the, the lutrophobia, that's a fear of otters. I, I don't know. That's what it is. The, the next one is the fear of peanut butter being stuck to the roof of your mouth. <laughs> you laugh, but there are people who actually identify with these things. And the last one, I hope it is nobody in this room, but it is the fear of believing that somewhere in this world there is a duck 
that is watching you. <laughs> maybe I've unleashed a new fear in you this morning, but these physical fears are things that maybe we felt or maybe we've experienced. Or maybe, I know they're stupid, but maybe you have something in your life that somebody else may look at and be like, really? That? You know, today, it's not the physical fears so much that gets us, but it's the, the psychological fears or it's the existential fears. It's fear of things like uh, feeling out of place. I, I get that sometimes. It's a fear of being found out. Well, what if people really knew what I was like? It's the fear of being left out. All my friends are doing this and I'm being left out. Or maybe it's just the one that goes by the acronym FOMO, the fear of missing out. I know this is, this is a big one. Somebody's out there doing something and I got to be a part of it. Fear is one of the most human responses that we can have. And many of the responses that we've developed in life when it comes to fear, they're healthy because they alert us when danger is around. They alert us when we have to just be on our guard about these things. And it's healthy and it is normal to listen to some fears, but there are other fears that keep us from living as God has designed us and intended us to live. And some of those fears pull us away from God's best for our lives. And I want you to just be in the mindset of talking about fear this morning because when we get over to the book of Judges chapter 6 and Judges chapter 7, we are going to see how fear plays a big part in one man becoming an unlikely hero. But to get there, we got to set the stage. And I know as I go through this, I am going to sum up very quickly for you, hopefully very quickly. I say that, but I'll probably get off on a tangent. I'm going to try to sum up five books of the Bible for you. Five books of the Bible. That's that's a long, that's a long thing to do. But last week we left off in the book of Exodus where Moses has been called by God to go to Egypt and to say, let my people go. If you remember the Ten Commandments movie, Charlton Heston, when he goes up, let my people go. Well, Moses goes and he does this, and he goes before the Pharaoh. I'm, I'm going to start talking faster. I just know it, so you're just going to have to deal with it. But Moses goes before the Pharaoh, and he asks him to let his people go, to let God's people, the Israelites, go because they had been living there for 400 years in harsh slave labor. Now, to do this, God would work these 10 plagues, these miraculous divine judgments from heaven upon the Egyptian people to eventually let the Pharaoh relent and let the people go. Now, the 10th one was the worst one when you really think about it. Because the 10th one, God had said, I will come through the land and I will strike down the firstborn of everyone that does not have the blood of a perfect lamb painted over the door frames of their houses. I will instead do what? Pass over those homes. Now, what God was trying to do in their lives is he was giving them something to remember. He was giving them a very clear object lesson to remember that something beyond them needed to be done to save them. And that would come up much later through the story of Jesus Christ, how Jesus was this perfect spotless lamb who was sacrificed for all of us so that we did not have to be fearful of sin, so that we would not have to be fearful of death, so that we would not have to be fearful from hell. And that is implanted in the story all the way back in the book of Exodus. Well, the Pharaoh eventually relents after all of this, and Moses and the people are pretty much kicked out of the land. And they're on their way, hopefully, to the promised land. And when you think about it, this is the point in the story where maybe we would like to think, well, and then they all lived happily ever after, right? But we know that's not what happened. Because as soon as they went out of, the prom or they went out of Egypt on their way to this land promised by God, the Pharaoh decides, I'm going to go after them. So he loads up his army in Egypt, and they go and they chase the Israelites down. So we have the Israelites with the Red Sea on their backs and the Pharaoh's army at their front. And what does Moses do? He listens to God and he raises his staff, the same staff that last week we saw became a snake in his hand. And then he picks it up. Not me. That, I would not do that. But Moses picks it up and he raises it up in the sea parts and the people walk through on dry land. And the whole time God is behind them holding off the Pharaoh's army in this pillar of cloud that is keeping the army from coming through. And as soon as all the people are across on dry land, the cloud moves, the army charges in and then the water crashes over them, and they all drowned. Victory secured, Israelite people freed. Once again, they all lived happily ever after. No, they did not. <laughs> because once there, they start complaining. God, we're hungry. So what does God do? He rains bread down from heaven every single morning. Then they get tired of eating the bread, and they want something else. What does God do for them? He drops down quail, and so they have meat every single day. They get hungrier, they get thirsty. What does God do? Here's water from a rock. You know, God is doing everything for these people over and over and over again. And all they do is grumble and all they do is complain. But they find themselves at the edge of the promised land. And this is over in the book of Numbers. They find themselves in the promised land or getting ready to enter into the promised land. And they send these spies out to go and to check out the land. And they come back and they're like, man, this place is good. 
A lot of good stuff over there, but there's also some really, really big people over there. There's giants over there, and we're not going to be able to go in and take the land. And because of that, because of the people's fear, remember all the stuff they had seen God do. Plagues, miraculous judgments from heaven. They have seen waters part. They have seen bread rain down from heaven every day, and now they are scared that God won't come through for them again. So God decides this whole generation, this whole generation that won't go in and take it over, you're all just going to be doomed to wander. So they wander for 40 years until the parents and the grandparents die out. And then the younger generation would be the ones that would step in and take over. Now, we talked about Moses. Last week, I told you that Moses is referenced in the New Testament over 80 times. Moses is a person who is looked at as a pillar of the Jewish faith, a pillar of very many faiths, really. But, but Moses, he himself did not trust God completely. So even he couldn't go into the promised land. So we have this new crew that's getting ready to go in, and a guy named Joshua is going to lead them. And God tells them when they go in that they're supposed to go, and they're supposed to subdue, and they are supposed to do something that sounds weird to our modern ears. They are supposed to go and clean out the land. They're to annihilate the people that are there. Now, we need to wrestle with something. Why would our loving God tell these people to go in and do this stuff? Well, it's because our God is also patient. It had been 400 plus years for these people living in this land that God had promised centuries before to his people who were underpinned sinners. They were people who practiced child sacrifice. They were people who practiced all sorts of horrible pagan rituals to their so-called gods. And God was going to bring judgment and justice upon them. And he wanted to do it through his people. But they didn't wholeheartedly obey. And so when they moved into the land, what they began to do is they began to want to look like and live like all the people around them. So they started adopting their practices. They started worshiping their gods. They started making idols just like them. And that's where we find the people of God in the book of Judges that I said we're coming to today. And if you know anything about the book of Judges, the book of Judges is a book just... <laughs> There's a lot of stuff going on here. And it can best be summed up in a verse at the very end of the book of Judges that says this. It says that in those days, the people had no king. And so they did whatever each person saw was right in their own eyes. And I want to tell you, in many ways, we still kind of live like this today. That there's no absolute truth. That there's no word that God has given us that is 100% true. And so people just live however they feel right in their own eyes. And that's what's going on in the book of Judges. And there's a cycle that keeps repeating over and over and over again throughout the book. The people will sin. The people will chase after all of these foreign gods and these idols. And because of that, God would bring justice upon them through the hands of the other nations around them. And for a time, those people would come in and subdue them. And because they were being oppressed, what would they then do? Uh, God, where are you? <laughs> God, why don't you help us out here? So they would turn back to God. God, save us. And God would be like, no, you've had your chance. No, God would miraculously raise up these leaders and these judges who would be like military leaders who would come and they would save the people and deliver the people and they would be brought back to another time of prosperity and another time of wholeness. But then very quickly, they would once more forget what God had done. They would forget that he was supposed to be their only God. They would forget all the things that had happened through the exodus, through the wilderness, and even for their parents and their grandparents. And that's where we find a man named Gideon in Judges chapter 6, who is probably one of the more unlikely heroes that we are going to talk about in this story. In Judges chapter 6, there's a new group of people that are oppressing the Israelites. There's a new group of people here who who are coming in, and, and, and the, the, the Midianites are said to be these people who are kind of a nomadic, wandering tribe, but wherever they went, they would just run and just completely rampant over the land and over the people. And that's where we find the people of God. They're, they're fearful and they're forgetful. And I want to admit this morning that there are times that I can find myself both fearful and forgetful. I've been very forgetful this past week, not just of, of, of God, but of a lot of other things. I, I forgot my keys in several different places. I forgot where my phone was this morning. I was accusing the ladies over here stealing my phone. No, just, just kidding, Joanne and Kim. I didn't really accuse you. I just asked you if you'd seen it, and they didn't, so I just kind of let it slide. But how many of us are fearful and forgetful? I mean, do you ever find yourself there just fearful and forgetful? We've been in a place like this. Sometimes it's physical exhaustion. 
I'm just so tired, and so I forget. Sometimes it can be um, just, just, just mental weakness. Sometimes it can be spiritual, just bleh. And so we forget, and we get fearful. Sometimes it's financial stress that puts us in this place. Sometimes it's medical issues. Sometimes it's a relationship problem. Or it can even be ongoing sin in our lives that keeps us fearful and forgetful. For the Israelites, once more, it's the Midianites who are causing them to forget that God had done something in the past and maybe he's going to do something again in our present and for our future. And we're going to enter into the story in Judges chapter 6, verses 11 through 16, and then we'll kind of walk through that. But just if you're there with me in the Old Testament, in verse 11 of chapter 6, it says, The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. And the Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. So Gideon, when we enter into the story, he's one that we may not exactly see it at first glance, but Gideon is timid, and Gideon is fearful. He is surely not the kind of person that we would pick to say, I want you to go out and lead the charge against this fearsome enemy. Those people that the Bible will say um, when they're in the valley and they look over the valley of, of the Midianites, it says that they're as thick as a swarm of locusts. That's how many people have come in and taken over their land, taken their livelihood, taken their crops. And the Israelites at this point are living in caves and they're living in dens in the mountains because the Midianites have moved into their homes. And Gideon even himself is hiding what he is doing from the eyes of the Midianites. What God was wanting to do in his life was change the way he saw himself to begin to see his life from God's perspective. The last seven years have been nothing but harshness. They've been nothing but oppression. And what does God say when he shows up and this angel speaks in Gideon's life? He says, the Lord is with you. But what does he call him? Mighty warrior. <laughs> The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Gideon shaking, Gideon's hiding, and he says, don't be afraid because God's with you, mighty warrior. Gideon was anything but that. He was anything but a mighty warrior. He surely didn't see himself in that way, but just as God has had to do with so many of these unlikely heroes, God's first words to Gideon, the Lord is with you, are you are not alone. You're not alone, Gideon. And Gideon responds in verse 13. He said, excuse me, Lord. He's doing it very respectfully. But he's pretty much saying, God, if you're with us, why are we going through all this stuff? God, if you're with us, why are we facing this hardship? God, if you're with us, why are the Midianites here? Why are they oppressing us? With all due respect, God, what gives, man? That's pretty much what Gideon is saying to God. I know it's implied there within the scripture. But Gideon only sees some circumstances. He only sees the circumstances going on around him. He doesn't see God in the circumstances. And how often... If I would raise my hand first this morning, how often do we do just that? We see our circumstances as overwhelming, but we forget to see that God is in the middle of those circumstances with us. We've heard stories of what God has done in the past. Maybe we've seen it in our own lives. Maybe we've heard it from the testimonies of others that God has brought me through this and brought me to this point. But this, what I'm going through now, it's too much. This situation, it's too far gone. God, I know you've done this other thing, but what I'm dealing with now, I've, I've got to be the only one to ever face this. Ever? Ever? Ever you? Ever you? Well, you're never alone. Somebody has had that circumstance. Somebody has had that situation. And what did God say to Gideon? I'm with you. I'm with you. You're never alone in whatever circumstance you're in. You know, few, if any, of God's people at this point in time of the story felt like God was with them. Gideon wasn't alone in that. The same feelings that came up in Egypt when they were facing their harsh time of slavery were coming up again. They were discouraged. They were beaten down, and hope was seemingly slipping away. And once again, we have been there before. 
Last week, I talked to you about a holy, a holy discontent, if you remember that phrase from last week. And that's that idea that there is a place in our lives where we see God has put something within us. Maybe it's a burden. Maybe it's a purpose. Maybe it's a passion. But we look at our lives. Maybe we look at our families, our workplaces, and our schools, and we see that this shouldn't be. And maybe you can look around the world right now, and you see things that what? shouldn't be that way. And God is Put this within you, this burden for maybe it's a certain people. Maybe it's just a certain family member. Maybe it's a certain friend. Maybe it's a certain aspect of the way your life is going. And God says it shouldn't be like that. And it just eats you up and it burns you up. And you wish and you pray and you hope that something was different. That's, that's a holy discontent. You want what God says to be in your life. And you want it when? Yesterday. <laughs> if not now. But maybe on the other side of that feeling, you feel, well, who am I to accomplish it? Who am I to step out? Who am I to be the one that God would use for such a time as this? Maybe you're fearful. Maybe you're doubting. Whatever it is, this is where Gideon's at. He doesn't feel up to the task. Well, God saw it differently. And he sees the same in our lives, too. Fear in our circumstances may overwhelm us. They might. Fear in our circumstances might overwhelm us, but it cannot keep God from doing something great in our lives. Your fear is no match for the God who calls you. Your fear is no match for the God who saves you. And in verse 14, God tells Gideon, I hear you, but I'm also sending you to go and to save your people. What does he say to him in verse 14? In verse 14, God says to Gideon, he says, go in the strength you have. And that might sound a little weird to us. What, what strength does Gideon have? What strength do any of us have? And that's the point here. God has already told Gideon, I will be with you. So who is Gideon's strength? God. God's already telling him, I'm going with you and I'm going to be your strength. He says, I am I not sending you. He is essentially saying to Gideon, Gideon, you've got everything you need. I know you're not enough, but I'm enough. I'll be with you. I'm sending you. And no, that's what God does for us. When he calls us and sends us, he also equips us and empowers us to do what it is that he calls us to do. But yet so often, I don't know about you again, but I find myself still wrestling with the fear. I find myself still wrestling with the doubt. God, really? Me? <laughs> and God's like, am I not sending you? Am I not enough? What did we sing just a little while ago? There's nothing better than you. There's better than you. There's also nothing greater than our God. There's nothing greater than him. We would do so well in our lives if we would remember that there is nothing better than, there is nothing greater than, there is no one more trustworthy than our God. That's what he's trying to get Gideon to remember. And if we thought Moses needed a lot of um, questions answered, if we thought Moses needed a lot of things to be reassured to him from God, he's got nothing on Gideon. Because in verse 15, Gideon starts complaining, and, and, and he's starting to get to this point where he's going to start asking God for all of these reassurances. But in verse 15, he's like, God, how can I do this? My family's not much, and even of that family that's not much, I'm the least of the bunch. And maybe, just maybe, we can relate. Maybe we've had dreams or plans for what we thought life was supposed to be, and here we are, and we're looking at it, and we're like, is, is this it? Is, is there not more? Is there not something greater to this? Maybe, maybe you've accomplished everything you've ever set out to accomplish in your life, and, and, and that's, that's great. But in some people's lives, maybe reality is the simple fact that whatever flame has been burning inside you to do great things for God, maybe life is just completely throwing buckets of water on it. And what used to be a roaring flame is maybe a little flicker of a fire. Well, those feelings, when we get that point, that is a lot of times what guides our decisions. But we shouldn't allow those feelings to guide our decisions. Instead, we should allow our faith in the God who calls us to guide our decisions and to guide our steps in life. And this is what Gideon is trying to learn here, or what God is trying to get Gideon to learn. You know, Gideon says, I'm not special. Well, no, he's not. There's nothing about him outside of the fact that God was calling him. And in verse 16, God says to Gideon one more time, I will be what? with you. This is one of the greatest promises of scripture, and we've seen it come up time after time within these stories of these unlikely heroes, the promise of God's presence in our lives. He says, I'll be with you and you will strike down the Midianites and you'll leave none alive. When I'm looking at Gideon, 
I don't know what he looked like physically. I just know what I get from this picture of him kind of spiritually and emotionally. Gideon would not have been the guy that we would have first picked maybe in a kickball game or in a dodgeball game in gym class, let alone to go lead this big army. But yet he's God's choice. He's God's choice, and he wants him to get past his fear and to step out in faith. And Gideon wants proof in verses 17 and 18. Look at that with me if you're still there. Gideon says, God, if I found favor in your eyes, give me a sign. Give me a sign you're really talking to me. And don't go away until I bring back an offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I'm going to wait until you return. And so Gideon goes. He makes bread. Gideon goes and he gets a goat and he boils the goat and he has this bread that he makes and he puts it on a rock. And then he takes the broth from this goat meat that he's cooked and he pours it over the rock. And the angel of the Lord comes with a staff, once again a staff, and touches the bread and touches the rock and it goes up in flames. And Gideon just, he's freaked out. He is, he asked for this sign, but he's freaked out when it comes. He's scared. He's fearful. And, 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 and he says in verse 22 of chapter 6, he says, Sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Kind of like Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6 where he sees this vision of the throne room of heaven and he says, Woe is me. In other words, whoa, I shouldn't be here. <laughs> and that's what Gideon is experiencing. But you see what God does for him in verse 23. The Lord said to him this word, peace. Peace. Do not be afraid. You're not going to die. You know, this is what comes when we step out in faith. And we get this backwards so often. So I don't want us to miss this this morning. But the peace of God within does not mean that the chaos without will be removed. I want you to catch that again. The peace of God within does not mean that the chaos without will be removed. What does Philippians chapter 4 tell us about the peace of God? It says it's a peace that transcends all understanding. That simply means that the peace of God is a peace that comes when we don't understand it. The peace of God is a peace that doesn't make any sense. The peace of God is a peace that when it shouldn't be there, it still is. When God wants us to go, when God wants us to move, when God wants us to put our faith muscles in action, we can have a settled peace within that the way forward and the way with God is the right way. You know, it's the same thing he promised to Moses. He said, I will be with you, Moses. It's the same thing he promised to Gideon. The Lord is with you. Peace to you, Gideon. And our minds can be racing. Our world can be shaking around us, but there is a peace that can be had within. Have you experienced this before? That everything around you makes no sense, but you're settled in here because the Holy Spirit speaks peace to your heart. That's what God does for Gideon. And he gives Gideon some instructions for what he wants him to do. And it's found in chapter 6, verses 25 through 32. And what, what God wants Gideon to do is he wants Gideon to go home. And he wants him to take a bull from his father's herd. He wants him to cut down these um, shrines to these pagan foreign gods that his own dad has built in the town. And he says, Gideon, I want you to destroy them. And I want you to burn them. And I want you to make an offering to me on this spot. And so what Gideon does is, is Gideon takes servants with him and the scripture tells us, I think verse 28, it says that Gideon is fearful. So he does it when? He does it at night. He does it under the cover of darkness because he's, he's still working through his fear issues. He's stepping out in faith, but he's still got a little bit of fear, but he does it at night. And so the people find it in the morning and they are just livid. And they set out and they want to kill Gideon because of this. But Gideon's dad, Gideon's dad slows them down. He slows them down and, and, and he stops them from putting his son to death. You know, what Gideon is doing here, it may seem a little strange that he would start with this when God has been calling him to go to the Midianites. Why start at home? Well, that's because the idol worship within their town, the idol worship within the region had put this barrier between them and God. And so what God had to do first off was God had to have Gideon tear that barrier down. He had to have him go and cut it off completely so that the people would know that there is a God in Israel, there's is a God in this world, and that is the God. It's not these false gods, it's not these foreign gods. And so Gideon was staking a claim that day in that town for God. 
This was an act declaring war, not just against the Midianites, but it was an act declaring war against all of those false gods. But yet Gideon is still fearful. He's still fearful, so he does it at night. But it's a first step, right? Sometimes we just got to take that first step, even if we're timid, even if we're fearful. God, you want me to do this? Well, I'll come this far. <laughs> and then after we do that, maybe we'll go this far, and then we'll go this far, and then we'll go all the way. And God was okay with that in this instance. See, what God was wanting him to do next would be a little bit more difficult. Gideon assembles this army. And we're told in chapter 7 that the army that Gideon assembles is some 32,000 men. And when you're looking at a room of just whatever we have in here today, if you talk about 32,000, I mean, we would just be swallowed up by that. 32,000 is a pretty good, it's a pretty good crew of people. But they're coming up against 135,000. So it doesn't sound as good. It doesn't sound as great. The battle would be unlikely. It would be improbable. It would be impossible for them to pull off that victory. So what Gideon does is he asks God for a sign. And it's found in chapter 6, verses 36 through 38. Gideon says, God, if you're going to save us, as you promised, I'm going to place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And that's what happened. Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed out the fleece, and, and all of this water came out of it. There was a bowl full of water, but Gideon didn't stop there. He says, okay, God, you've done this one thing for me. Now what I want you to do is I want you to flip it and do it the other way. I want you to do it the other way. Let the fleece be dry, and let the ground be wet all around it. And amazingly, God does the same thing again. God would come through both times for Gideon when he needed these reassurances. And I want to tell you, how many of you heard of, talked about people putting a fleece out? Have we heard of this or maybe people doing this? I just say this first off, this is not meant to be prescriptive for us today. Now, I don't believe it's a horrible thing in our lives to ask God for reassurances because I do believe God reassures us in many different ways about the things he has called us to do. So don't get what I'm not saying this morning. But what Gideon is doing here, this is a sign of Gideon's weakness more so than his strength. This is a sign of Gideon still being scared and fearful. And sometimes we lack the faith to see what God has already called us to do. We shouldn't bash Gideon for his fear, but we should take a look at how patient God is to say, well, you need this, I'll do it. You need that, I'll do it. You need another reassurance, oh, I'll do that too. And that same thing is true in our lives. Whether Maybe it's a word from a friend sometime that God puts in our lives to reassure us. Maybe it's a, an encouraging note. Maybe whatever it is that God is with us and he's on our side when we're afraid. That's what he does for Gideon. And so the battle is about to take place. Flip over to chapter 7 with me. Verses 1 through 3. Early in the morning, Jerob Baal, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. What does God say if anybody's scared? How many of us would have left? <laughs> We're in the army. We're facing this battle to come in. There's got to be a little bit of fear already going into battle. Maybe there are some who are just geared and ready and go to war, but there's a little bit of healthy fear to be brought up when you're facing a battle like this. And Gideon's probably like, God, are you, are you sure? Maybe Gideon's even thinking about leaving, but it's amazing. Gideon stays. Gideon stays. So how many do we have left? 10,000. Yeah, 10,000. To take on how many? 135,000 people. Now we're ready. 10,000 versus 135,000. Let's ride, right? God's got other plans. The Lord said to Gideon, there's still too many men. Verse 4, take them down to the water, and I will thin them out for you there. If I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. God wants to make it perfectly clear that it is not the strength of the 10,000 men. God wants to make it perfectly clear it is not the strength of these people, but it is what? It is God and it is his hand that will deliver the Israelites from the Midianites. It wasn't Gideon. It wasn't these people, but it would be God. And there's a weird way that God decides to do this. And here's how he thins it out in verses 5 through 8. 
Gideon takes the men to the water. The Lord says, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. So 300 of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like the dog, and all the rest got down on their knees to drink. And the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300. And at least they left their provisions and they left what? Their trumpets. Thanks for the trumpets, guys. We were ready to go into battle with these extra 9,700 trumpets. Is that my math correct? Anybody got a calculator on their phone? Um, so, so here we have 300 men to face 135,000. And God has to give Gideon one last nudge of confidence to go. And so he does in verses, verses uh, 8, 8 through 11. Verses 8 through 11, God tells Gideon to go, and, 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 and he would tell him to go to the camp. And in the camp with his servant, in verse 11, they listen to what is being said. And God says, afterwards, you will be encouraged to attack them. So Gideon and his servant go and they climb outside the camp and they start listening to what some of the people are saying in the camp. And one of the men is talking to another man and he says that he has this weird dream. This weird dream that this loaf of bread comes flying through the camp and it knocks over one of the tents and the tent can't withstand this giant loaf of bread apparently and it collapses and the other man looks at him in verse 14 and he he interprets the dream for him he says this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon God has given the Midianites meaning us and the whole camp into his hands God has now reassured Gideon one more time that he was about to do something that Gideon just can't even begin to understand so what does Gideon do? He's pumped up, but he stops to worship God. He bows down. He worships God. He thanks God. He praises God. I think it's amazing the patience that God has shown in Gideon's life from where he was when God showed up and he was fearful and he was timid. And God says, hey, mighty warrior, I'm with you. To what he is now. He's pumped and ready for battle with 300 guys, and he's praising God that God is about to send him and 300 others into battle against 135,000. It's amazing what God is doing in this man's life. Gideon, this unlikely hero, the anything but a mighty warrior, and God gave him every encouragement he needed along the way. If you look back at the story of your life, and just think real quick, just do a quick middle Mental exercise. Just think back at the story of your life. You probably had some trying times in your life. I'm raising both hands. I just got a microphone. Lots of trying times in your life. And, and, and maybe you've had some things that have happened to you like this as well. Maybe you've seen God have every encouragement in your life to steer you on the course where he wants you to be. Maybe it came because of a parent that prayed for you. Maybe it came because of a friend that invited you to a church or some ministry event. Maybe it was a text or a phone call when you were just at the end of your rope. Maybe you showed up to, to school or to work one day and there was just an encouraging note that was left behind for you. Maybe you were driving down the road, fighting back the tears, not knowing where you were driving, but all of a sudden maybe it's a song on the radio or God just speaks something to your heart and it snaps you out of it. See, those are the things that we consider, what, coincidences, right? The things that we consider just, oh, well, that just happened. No, the things that we might consider coincidences in this life might be the very things that God has been using to push us out of fear and uncertainty into his calling. Into his calling. So Gideon is at this point now, and he's ready to go into battle, but he has no slings or stones like David has. He has no staff in his hand like Moses had. No, what does he have? Well, he has jars. He has trumpets. And he has torches, but he has them in abundance for all of these 300 guys. So on the one hand, you've got these so-called weapons. And on the other hand, you've got God, who says, I'm going to use this to deliver you. I so want normal for my life. You're looking at me, and you're like, you are so far from normal. But I so want a normal story for my life. I want things to be like this. <laughs> I want everything figured out. I want everything laid out for me. Yeah, we want a little adventure from time to time. Who can't with my kids and my family? We all want normal, right, sometimes to a certain extent. But oftentimes, the way that God works in our lives is anything but normal. And I hope you're seeing that through these stories. 
Sometimes God works through things that just aren't in the ordinary, supernatural things, and that's what God does here. He works through human weakness to bring about his strength. That's what this story shows to us. That's what so many of the stories of the Bible show to us, God working through human weakness to show his strength. Why? Why do these stories pop up from time to time? Because they all point to the greatest story of God using human weakness to show his strength. And that story is the story of who? Jesus Christ. Jesus, who when he entered into our world, he stooped down to take on human flesh and become like us. He lived on this earth like we lived, but he did it perfectly. So many missed Jesus when he first walked to this earth because they weren't looking for weakness as a show of strength. They wanted military might. They wanted political strength. They wanted all of this stuff. But then there was Jesus, the suffering servant, who took our sin and bore it upon him on a cross where he suffered and died for us who deserved that punishment. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says this. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through you his poverty might become rich. See, the cross is a reflection of what God is doing, gaining an unlikely victory through supposed human weakness to show his strength. But I want to tell you, the message of the cross itself, what I'm talking about right now, this message is another thing that people stumble over because we can't see it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says this, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. What is Paul saying? He's saying to those of you who think you are the likely ones chosen by God, those ones who have it all together, you have the ability, you have the intellect, you have the strength. What Paul is saying is that to us, you're missing out on what Jesus came to do. Because Jesus didn't come to call people by human standards. Jesus came to call people by God's standards. Those who would admit in their humility that they don't have it, but he does. And that he can work through them. That's what God did through Jesus. It's what God did in Gideon's day as well. And God had done this before in the not-so-distant history of, of Gideon's people. He did it at the Battle of Jericho when they marched around and blew trumpets and the walls fell down. But in Judges chapter 7, 17 through 22, let's, let's just finish out this story here real quick. Watch me, Gideon says to them, follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then from all around the camp blow yours and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. Just after they had changed the guard, they blew their trumpets and broke their jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew their trumpets and smashed the jars. And grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow, they shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And while each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. And when the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. They are so confused by what God is doing around them through Gideon that these Midianites, this strong and vast army, army starts fleeing. But not only that, they start striking each other down. And so the 300 that are gathered around the camp are just standing there watching what God is doing in their midst. Do we believe that God still does things like that for us today? Maybe you don't have a jar or a torch or a trumpet. It's not what I'm saying. But maybe in your life, God just says, just, just watch what I'm about to do. You don't see a way through. You don't see that there's anything that, that is very likely about your story. Well, watch what I'm about to do. We're getting ready to close up here in a second. We're going to have a time of response as Trevor and Hallie and, and the rest of the crew come up to lead us. But what I want to remind uh, it, myself even and everybody who's within just sound of my voice this morning is that what God did in these instances, he, he still does today. What God did in some of these stories, he, he can still do for us today. The same God who gave Gideon courage can infuse courage into your heart. You know, our situations that we're living in, that we find ourselves in, so often we find ourselves not living God's best for our lives. And if you have a situation like that today, maybe only you and God knows what that is. But because of that situation, it might, may seem unlikely in your life, whatever battle you're facing, that you're a mighty warrior. 
It may seem unlikely, but I want to tell you this morning, that battle is not yours. You may be in the midst of it. You may be on the front lines of it, but that battle is not yours. Whose is it? It is God's. He is the one who fights our battles for us. Even when it seems the enemy has us surrounded, even when it seems the enemy has us outnumbered, even if it's 300 against 135,000, this truth of Scripture, 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 says this, says that the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. And the key in that passage of Scripture is this. In him, are you in Jesus? Are you in Jesus? Have you given your life to Jesus? Have you surrendered to his will for your life? Have you asked him to forgive you of your sins and each and every day you are choosing to follow him? That is the key there. When you are in him, then where is he? In you. Through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit taking up residence within you. In this life, we will face hardship. In this life, we will all have fears. Some of them are practical. <laughs> some, of them, some of them help us avoid situations we shouldn't be in. But God said to Gideon in his fear, he said, peace, I will be with you. And the same is true for each and every one of us today when we trust in him. We don't need to be bound by fear any longer. We don't need to live defeated lives anymore because Jesus has won the victory for us. God has set us free from fear and sin to live for him. So this morning, what I'd like to ask you to do, maybe you just need to spend a few moments praying for that peace for your life. Maybe this morning, maybe you know what God is calling you to do to step out and you're just, God, I don't feel it. I'm not courageous. I'm not a mighty warrior. There's no peace in my life. It's just all this junk. When you pray and ask for courage and peace, he will give it to you. He will be that for you because the Lord is our strength in all of these things. If you need to pray this morning, I invite you to come. If not, pray where you're at. But ask God for peace. Ask God for strength. Ask God for courage. Ask him to help you step out into the things you know he is calling you into. And then watch what he does. Watch what he does. Will you stand as we sing and respond this morning?